Okay, we are live now. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this uh, fifth session in the series, Is Just Culture Desirable for Learning? Um, my name is Nipin. Uh, I'm the founder of Nobelis, and I'm joined by four very intelligent people this morning or evening, their time, of course, um, uh, to debate on this topic. Um, we'll start with a light introduction from everyone, and then we will delve into the topic. Um, Jay, would it be okay if I asked you to give a light introduction about yourself? Uh, hi there. Yes, uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, a very exciting opportunity. I'm, I'm Jay. I work in, in healthcare. I'm a doctor in Leicester, United Kingdom. I work in emergency medicine, uh, interested in patient safety, especially because I used to be an IHI fellow 10 years ago. Um, uh, and, and on top of that, I still continue to do quite a lot of work specifically in the area of improving uh, quality of care for older people. Um, I'm also doing a master's in law from Edinburgh uh, University in medical law and ethics because I really want to understand uh, how the law shapes our behavior, especially when it comes to just culture. Brilliant. Thank Very you. pleased to have you and honored to have you, Jay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, Clive, hello, Clive. Would you like to say a few words? Not that people need this, but we'll do it anyway as a ritual. I know you want it to be quick, Nippon, so I'll be very, very brief. So my name is Clive Lloyd. Um, I don't play cricket. Just for those who might have tuned in for that reason, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Um, I'm a psychologist, and I, um, for a living, I try to humanise organisations. There, yeah, that'll do me. Great. Thank you, Clive. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hello, Kim. Good evening. Hello, Nippon. How are you? Good, good. Good to see you. So yes, uh, I am the head of HSC for Circo Asia Pacific, and I've worked across many, many industries for almost 20 years in safety. And Clive and I go way back, I think, to uh, some diamond mines back there in Yellowknife, hey, Clive, and all the, sure <laughs> all the great places in the world um, where there's heavy industry. And uh, Just Culture is a concept or a theory that's particularly dear to my heart. I really... Um, yeah, I put a strong, like a high amount of value on it, and I've seen how it can really benefit an organisation. Um, it's challenging to put into practice, though, so looking forward to fleshing that out tonight, Nippon, in terms of what good looks like for uh, for Just Culture. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Once again, very honoured to have you. Um, Daniel, you have been absent from LinkedIn, so it's so nice to see you after a while. <laughs> Thanks, Nipin. It is a pleasure to be back, and thank you for, for inviting me to contribute to this session. Um, so uh, in my substantive role, I'm the head of innovation for WorkSafe New Zealand. At the moment, I'm in a sort of seconded into a transformation lead role for the organization, but working out of Sweden, so uh, based in Linköping. Um, over the last 15 years or so, I've been in different safety innovation roles in, in a range of industries, so I'm really focusing my work on developing better practices, better solutions, better procedures or processes for organizations that can um, align more with, with many of these values that I've heard already about, more humanizing organizations. So I'm, um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yes, so are we. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and maybe we can start with you, uh, Daniel. Uh, Help us mm. understand what's your perspective or what's your view on just culture? What does yeah. it mean to you? So I've, I've taken as a starting point for this discussion the, um, the expressions that I've seen of just culture in, in quite a few organizations where I've been involved in meetings where often the leadership team, um, sometimes with the help of supervisors, are sitting down to determine the accountability for undesirable events. And at their disposal, they have some sort of um, process or, or framework to support the decision to decide the accountability of uh, essentially, um, I guess you have all, all seen these where there's sort of a flow chart of deciding the intent behind it and uh, the sort of the attenuating circumstances that surrounded the action. And when I try to explore why do organizations have this in place and where is it coming from, everyone says that this is a big step forward because before that it was completely ad hoc, whimsical decisions about 
accountability. So this is a huge step forward about creating transparency and starting to create a just culture. And, and that tends to be across the line that people think that this is a step forward. Um, I am quite skeptical of that notion um, because just because you put something on paper, just because you make it available to everyone to see, it doesn't make it just. You can have whatever in that. Um, and of course, you could have all kinds of different outcomes. So pretty much everything that I've seen that is in practice in large organization is actually, it's really backward looking. It's more about blame. Um, it is holding the organization back from, from learning. It's actually impeding learning or constraining learning. And, um, and the main, main reason for that is, of course, that the whole framework is a sort of a comparative framework. We're looking through, we're looking at what happened. We're looking at the world through a lens of what should be in place or through a lens of what is already known. That means that um, the information flows from the organization onto, well, from the framework onto the organization, if you will, uh, to signal what is important, what is right. And then, of course, meaningful to have that to some degree. But that's my point. If we want to have learning, if we want to see the world in a new light, if we want to be surprised by what's going on in our organization, we're just sort of fundamental elements for any learning activity. We need to have processes um, that will ensure or enable information to flow from the world onto us as decision makers and not the other way around. So um, I think it's, it's quite possible to create those. And, and I know that there are some organizations that are, are having much more, I guess, open frameworks, open questions that will trigger curiosity, that will allow them to learn new things. And, and when that happens, when that works out, you start to see how, how this sort of blame game moves towards empathy or sympathy for people involved as to why they didn't use the right equipment or why they didn't follow the procedure. And when we get to that level of understanding of how people's behaviors and their decisions made sense, we have um, a much better chance to take um, action that will create uh, a new level of performance for the future. That doesn't mean that we forget about the accountability. And, and I think that's a mistake that has happened in this discussion many times that we, we think we have to do away with the accountability discussion. But I think that's uh, a naive notion. If you listen to how organizations talk, um, we, we, we need to think about that. But I do think that this notion, you, you probably read about future looking accountability versus uh, backwards looking. So when we can set up to think about, well, what kind of future we want to have and how can this person be part of, of creating that future that we'll want to have, I think we can maintain the notion of accountability. But we really need to think carefully about what the Just Culture tool is doing to our organization, to our people. I think it impacts culture and influences culture, but it doesn't set the culture. It's too one off -y to to be to have that sort of impact. So yeah, that how's that as a starting point? It's it's an excellent starting point. And what, what I took from this conversation, and it's a typical problem in the maritime world at least, I'm I'm, I'm naive about other sectors, but uh, is how preconceived notions, preconceived ideas uh, actually hinder learning. I think this is what you're trying to say. And that's my my interpretation, of course. And that mm. kind of impedes uh, any sort of uh, um open-mindedness to, to new ideas that don't fit with our worldview and hence get rejected. But I think uh, for the benefit of the read, uh, listeners, it would also be interesting, you, you, you mentioned the idea of forward-looking accountability. Uh, could you expand upon it a little bit and then we can move on to Kim then? Yeah, sure. So uh, we start with the contrast. Backward-looking um, backward uh, accountability is really to look at what, what happened in the past and compare it to the, um, the, the processes and procedures we set up for, for yesterday's performance. Um, so we, we're just looking at that. But if we think about that, those are sort of arbitrary. They are in the constant process of being transformed to the next level of or next iteration of, of what we have in place. And if we open up that system to say, 
sure, that was our best guess with yesterday's notion. But actually, let's look at this incident to see not only what was problematic with the behavior, but what is problematic with us as an organization and what does this incident um, invite us to become, right? Um, in terms of changing the system that is enabling performance, uh, both good and bad. Um, then we open up the future and, and our decision becomes much more difficult because we start to question a lot more things. It becomes a much more complex thing. But by opening up the future to be many more things than just the changed behavior of this individual, um, we have a, a future looking uh, process. And then you invite the accountability um, aspect into that. How can this individual that has had, has been involved or maybe um, has some sort of you know problematic notion of, of trust in relation to, to his team or supervisors following this incident, how can they be part of creating this new, new world that we want to have to see that this is not about just absolving people of responsibility, but actually involving them for the future that they sh too surely would want to see to avoid uh, these things from, from repeating. Yes, great. I mean, uh, a future-looking process uh, and and uh, tapping into the experience, imagination, creativity, and experience of the work, uh, not the work, it's a very loaded term, uh, of, of the person. Um, great. That's forward-looking accountability. Thank you, Daniel. That's uh, very, very kind of you to share those, those thoughts. Kim, let's move to you now. What do you think about the idea of a just culture? So I come from a slightly, uh, perhaps a slightly different perspective, uh, Nippon, from the pr practitioner perspective, having gone into an organisation that was heavily focused on blame and then taking on that challenge around changing those mental models around people being the problem and looking at how we can shift from a heavy, well-entrenched blame game that, uh, that existed. And, uh, you know, I think we were quite successful in putting... I think from memory we did have a flow chart, but I relied on some research there from Diane, who I understand has been on one of these um, forums with UNIPIN. Um, there's some published research that she did. Uh, sorry, I've just got the name of the, the article here if anyone's interested in it. It was uh, from Individual Behaviour to System Weakness, the Redesign of the Just Culture Process of an International Energy Company, Diane Chadwick-Jones, 2018. And, uh, and in there, there was a flow chart that I found particularly interesting that I did draw on because I found the organisation that I was in, they really didn't know, you know, they wanted something to grasp to that was traditional. So whilst there are very, um, there are a lot of, you know, drawbacks from having that flow chart, um, especially, you know, given that they're all very similar and very traditional, I found in this case in developing a guideline for them that it was useful in starting to turn the dial away from, from the blame game. I also found um, it to be really important to start to establish learning reviews on what we sometimes call learning teams and spending some time talking with leaders around these things called cognitive biases that they have that they're not really familiar with, like hindsight bias and counterfactuals. Um, and, you know, giving them insight into, okay, actually this is, you know, what I sometimes bring to an investigation, this is what I bring to the table, this is sometimes what clouds good learning. They were then able to start to control from them. So when we had some significant incidents occur, you know, we were able to step back and go, okay, hang on a second, let's try and put this just culture into practice. Let's try to set that forward-looking accountability that Daniel was talking about there. And Yip and I have to say it worked well and we managed to turn the tide on the blame game, except when a really significant incident occurred. And it was almost like, oh, hang on a second, this just culture framework, we like it for these types of incidents that are, and they had some type of severity to them. But here we've got a, you know, an incident that could have been a fatality, it had a high risk potential to it. Um, so therefore, we're going to leave the just culture framework at the door and we're going to go to a traditional investigation. We couldn't simply apply that framework to this situation. So that's where I found it starting to get a little bit challenging in making sure we follow through with it because we didn't really want to have two sets of frameworks at play. And uh, as some of you might know from the Australian landscape, industrial manslaughter laws are now well and truly in place and we're starting to see case law emerge. So I do wonder 
does that lead organisations to move back toward a more retributive culture because they assume that's what they need to have in place to avoid these industrial manslaughter laws in place? Thanks, Nippon. Great, great. Uh, and uh, um, what I'm hearing, uh, Kim, is the usefulness of, of uh, some kind of a consistent approach uh, to, to the notion of just culture. Um, and then um, it kind of becomes a challenge uh, when something of, of consequential nature happens and we tend to fall back on the, on the, on the same old ideas of orthodox safety. Um, if I can use the word, um, you talked about system weaknesses and you, how, how you were able to identify some of the system weaknesses using that framework. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit, Kim? Sure. So what I did was I took that paper from Diane. I found it really useful to set up the, the system for the organisation I was in, obviously in collaboration with interested parties such as HR and IR. They were very concerned about what this system looked like that I was putting into place. And it almost felt like the uh, HR policies we had in place were written for that very, very small percentage of employees who might engage in some kind of criminal behaviour. And so we'd set up those policies for the rest of the people who <laughs> do not engage in criminal behaviour and are just trying to do a good job and errors sometimes happen. Um, so, yeah, the system... Um, you know, I wrapped up nicely into this, you know, standard operating procedure and this guide. And it, and it did look also at the forward-looking accountability. And just going back to Daniel's points before about that, I think organisations, they like the idea of just culture, but when it starts to, you know, the rubber hits the road and they have to put it into practice, they don't know what forward-looking accountability looks like. They don't have a frame of reference for it, perhaps because in society, perhaps it's not something we see vastly and openly. So I very much had to work hard with the stakeholders to go, okay, in putting this system into practice, here we have an event. Normally we would blame this person, perhaps they would be... Uh, um, terminated and they'd no longer be working for the organisation, let's try out this forward-looking uh, accountability component of the system and let's put this into practice. And it was then when they got that practical experience in seeing how we worked with this individual or individuals involved in the incident to actually decide on how we were going to learn from this, how we were going to move forward and become better as an organisation, that they then started to build that mental model for the forward-looking accountability so that had a, a significant part of the whole system that uh, that we had in place. Thank you, Ken. Thanks very much for sharing that. Um, we go to Clive now. Clive, um, would you like to share your thoughts on what you think is this idea of just culture? Yeah, sure. Nepin. Look, um, I'm working almost uh, exclusively these days as a practitioner. And that means most days I'm working around um, oil and gas, mining, construction globally. And most of my clients, most of the people I work with actually would consider themselves to have a just culture. Um, <laughs> and then we talk further. Um, so for me, a, a just culture first up is, is pretty rare. They also infer that a just culture is this binary thing where if, if you've got a just culture, it's different to an unjust culture. So it's one or the other. It's often viewed as binary, and I, I really don't see it in that way. Um, I don't think it's binary at all. If, if anything, it's more of a continuum, if, if you will. Uh, most of the companies who believe they have a just, just culture believe so because they have some sort of policy or set of policies or flowchart. It's very common. Um, and for me, uh, it is never the flowchart or the, the policy that's going to actually determine a just culture. Uh, a policy simply cannot make, make it safe to speak up. Um, I was in a very senior leader's office the other day, and I'd been there most of the day. And he said, uh, Clive, you will notice that uh, I have an open door policy. And I, I indeed did know that. And indeed, I did notice that the door had been open all day. I thought what was a little bit odd, though, is that nobody actually walked through it. Uh, so again, you can have as many policies like that as you like. It does not mean it, it's safe to speak up. So, look, for most of them, how do they see a just culture? And look, the way I largely view a just culture is um, a sort of ideal, maybe idyllic, um, some might say utopian state 
uh, whereby maybe a company has, um, well, they're consistently able to balance, um, you know, learning from safety work with, with accountability. Um, and again, somehow they're able to draw that line consistently. But for me, the thing with that line is it's not actually so important where that line is. And I agree with Sydney Decker on this. It's much more important that the processes behind determining who drew up that line um, is understood and, and also agreed upon. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, it, it's just really very unlikely that we're going to get to this place of a just culture. The other thing I'd like to discuss maybe later is, is the learning aspect of this. We'll come to that. Because, yeah, it, it's learning for me that is viewed as often the rationale, the justification for the need for a just culture. And it, it also then infers that, well, you don't get learning if you don't have a just culture. And that is simply not true. Because people are always learning. People will learn just as much, if not more, from an unjust culture, if you will. Uh, I think we're suggesting with a just culture, we are learning in a bit more, um, well, directed way and learning things perhaps that we would view as valuable towards safety or work. Whereas possibly, I'm going to suggest we're still learning very much. In an The way I'm viewing learning here is I'm a simple man, right? Um, neurons that wire together, fire together. We're constantly doing that, whether the, the culture is just or otherwise. So, look, that's a bit of a snapshot, I guess, of how I see that. Yes, neurons that wire together, fire together. I'll remember that metaphor. Thank you for educating me. But uh, coming back to your, 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 your key issue, as I'm hearing is this constant balance between learning and accountability is what you call just culture. Uh, what's particularly intriguing to me is that what you, when you say who draws that line is more important mm. than anything else. So what, what do you mean by that? Like, could you please elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, again, I think um, we often think that it's within a company that we decide where that line is. And that's usually fraught because there are many um, things that influence that that are not even within the company. There are, of course the laws of the state, the laws of the land. There are public perceptions. There are public expectations, all of which flavour where that line is likely to end up. But at the end of the day, somebody, possibly within the company, is going to need to draw that line. Uh, and often that is not made overt. Often the flowchart just is the flowchart without mention of who actually drew that up, who effectively eventually signs off on it. And I think there's, there's also marvellous opportunities in understanding this process, really great opportunities. So I do work a lot in the field of psychological safety and trust. And when I'm working with clients, it's the process of sort of understanding what a just culture is all about that can be a really valuable tool to create trust in the first place because we need to get a bit transparent about um, who is going to draw that line, who has the power to... The, for example, decide whether something was a mere accident as opposed to a blatant violation. You know, we, who makes that decision? Who judges that? Somebody's going to sign off on that. So we need to take all of those things into account. Uh, Kim mentioned industrial manslaughter laws. If you don't think that's going to impact or affect where the line is drawn in a company, again, I think we're being a little naive. Yep. So what I'm hearing is a process of understanding the just culture process. All right, brilliant. Um, that's 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 interesting. Thank you, thank you, Clive. That's a that's a very very. Um, uh, so there's as you can already see there is there's different views on 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 the the notion of just culture, and that's fantastic. We'll go to Jay now. Jay, what what what's your view? Um, thank you. Well, I'm actually to pick on what Clive left really because. Um, I think there's no better place to start than how we do things now. Um, and the bottom line is how we do things now in the, in the NHS is that there is something called a Just Culture Guide, uh, which the NHS has published, and you're supposed to follow that. But it also very clearly says you should not be using that until, you know, you are absolutely certain that this is the human being who was uh, to, 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 to really responsible. And then you go through it. It's sort of derived from the, the original James reason um, um, you know, incident uh, culpability, you know, kind of like guide. I, I, and you basically then come out by, by saying, you know, did the individual do it? I, I think to, to me, th this 
is probably the, the, the first error in our process of understanding and using just culture. I think that question should be asked first and foremost every time an error happens. Was this purposeful with a desire to cause harm? Because we know, going by the people who work it, that, I don't know, 95 to 99% of people do not come to work in any industry with a desire to cause harm. So therefore, if the intent was not to cause harm, we should automatically eliminate the fact that this is not due to the individual. Because it doesn't matter. They were not driven by the desire to cause harm, but harm happened right. Now, once we have dissociated the individual, we then start looking at why did the harm happen? And then it becomes a very different discussion. Easy to say, much harder to do because biases. And one of the biggest problem with biases, I think, is that it is, lacked to, it is linked to self-competence, self-confidence, and self-esteem. So every individual who looks at another person's error, the first thing they tend to say is, well, I would never have done that. You know, how would the idiot even do that? Because I'm an exceptional person. You know, I can never possibly commit an error. And it goes back to that, you know, the throwing stone metaphor. You know, we are very, very keen to throw stones without ever asking the question, would I, could I have done this in this situation? And, you know, I, I, I'm just an emergency physician. And I have to confess, every time I look at these things and I say, I could have done any of those. Um, or on a, on a normal day, I could have done any of those. Which brings us to the next question is, what is normal and what is abnormal? Because we have got a habit of every time when harm happens, we consider that harm to be a special cause variation. It should never have happened, okay? Because harm is not allowed to happen in systems. And, and I know the Civil Aviation Authority is in a different league when it comes to uh, acknowledging that. But there is a big challenge in healthcare because death as an outcome in healthcare is a normal outcome. There is nothing abnormal about people dying in hospitals. They always do. The key question that we need to understand is, was this death a preventable death, an avoidable death, number one, number two? If it was, what was it in the system that didn't work? And the inquiry should always be starting with the mindset of what was wrong in the system. Because if you want a learning culture, then it has to be designed towards improving the system, because that is what a learning culture is all about. It is not about improving an individual. It's about improving the system. It's as it is what, you know, uh, this common kind of usage in, in, in the kind of safety uh, literature about shifting, shifting your, 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 your dot. You basically take your normal distribution curve and you move the entire curve to one side. So you shift the performance of the entire organization rather than trying to chop off those aberrancies at two ends and, and pretend you, your organization is so, so much better that those aberrant individuals have been sacked. So if you're going to move towards a just culture, the next thing we need to do, uh, which is probably the easier thing to do, is start measuring daily performance. Only when we know what is normal and what is variation within three standard deviations of each and every activity that we do, will it become easier to define why was there a departure that was outside three standard deviations and then ask the question, right, let's see, was this departure due to a system design or was this due to an individual behaving differently? And that is a key because even when you start looking at those 1% of events outside three standard deviations and you track them over time, you might find they are part of a separate normal distribution curve where those events are a common cause variation. And it's so important to understand the data that without the data, we absolutely should never even ask the question, what I'm seeing, is this normal? Or is this just a variation of normal and it should be expected in the system? Uh, and that is where I think we are lagging really, really badly. Uh, and it's a shame because NHS also has the awesome safety one and safety two guide, really looking at the approaches and getting people to think about, you know, designing for the person. But we, we, we don't look at those because we are so biased in our system that we could never have done this, you know, committed this error. But the first instance we get, we, we beat up other people. Uh, and, and it's a real shame. It is. And a wonderful articulation. And what caught me thinking was this, uh, this you know, from your first point, which is how do you disassociate yourself uh, in those moments? I think 
practitioners uh, from a particular profession are always divided between what they say and what they do. Uh, that's a, a big flaw in the interviewing um, uh, techniques also, that we rely so heavily on what people say and not what they actually uh, think of how they make decisions. But a, a bigger point is that I see you using the word system and culture. Uh, and I, I would really love, in very few words, to, uh, we are just, I'm just being conscious of the time. Could you help me understand how you see the difference or is there no difference in your world? Because between, we're talking about just culture. I just want to understand from you, do you see any difference between the word system and culture? No, no. absolutely okay. don't. Okay. I think they are exactly the, the same and one and same thing. I, I, I think... the. the so, so in my mind, because as an emergency physician, I'm very much given to doing. I'm, I'm an activist. Um, you know, there is a time for thinking, there's a time for doing. Great if you can combine the two. But the bottom line to, to me is uh, once I've understood all of those and read all the papers, what does it look like for the patient? Yeah. What does the patient experience? And in order for the patient to experience the right kind of care, we need to have the right kind of system. And that right kind of system has to have the right culture, meaning the right processes. So yep. the structure of the system and the way the processes are designed and delivered will basically dictate outcome. I'm going back to the very simple Donovan triad here. Uh, and if you are going to really understand the structure and how the processes are designed, you have to understand how do you design both of those to support the staff who is going to deliver for the customer. Yeah. And, and the problem is that most of us are so deeply inside the culture, we lack the ability to step outside and properly look at it objectively. And I think if we are going to learn from, from you know, using just culture, expanding it, the first thing we need to stop doing is getting individuals who belong to the industry to investigate their own systems. We need safety technologists to have nothing to do with that industry. So, yeah. so one of the best things that has happened in the in the UK recently is, is this uh, the new organization. I mean, it's not that new, but but it's been there. All the professional standards standards authority. I, I have to say, when I, when I read of them and learned of them, I was like, oh, this looks really interesting. So they basically are regulating the regulators. They're providing overview over how GMC works, LMC works, GDC works, etc. But what was really encouraging about it? Not a single person on that board comes from a health and social care background because that is an exclusion criteria. And I thought that was really, really clever. Doesn't matter how much I feel I am reasonably, you know, objective in my approach. I am part of the system. I can never be purely objective. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jay. That's that's very, very wonderfully articulated once again. Um, uh, so uh, in the interest of time, we have about 20 more minutes to go and I'll be crisp with the next question, which is, I will start with Daniel. Um, how do you understand learning? But also, how do you contextualize learning within the notion of just culture? Does it make sense, the question? So in, in another way, what is your view on learning? Mm -hmm. And is just culture desirable for learning? It would be great if you had sent these questions out beforehand, but uh, let's go. <laughs> I uh, did. <laughs> <laughs> Not that particular one, but look, the the, the learning notion, um, I, I do believe it was uh, Dr. Drew Ray who said something like, um, learning happens when you can do new things, or you can do th things in a new way, if you will. Um, so until you sort of achieve that of, of, of understanding things or, or realizing how, how things are connected in a, in a new kind of way, you haven't really learned anything. Um, so... With, with that sort of definition on learning, on, on with the ultimate end goal of we need to lift our game, we need to be able to do things in a new way as an outcome of, of something that has happened. Then the, the question is, is whether the just culture process or framework um, allows us to um, discover things, to learn things that we didn't know beforehand. And I'm not just talking about categorizing things or putting them into a flow chart here. But actually, how does the process allow us to step outside ourselves, to move to more holistic? I'm, I'm a little bit, um, Jay, you mentioned the, the, this, no, the, the ideal of objectivity, which I don't really believe is achievable. I think we can move to more and more holistic understanding, but it, it's, it's something, you know, this, this, it's, 
quickly becomes very complex to the more subjectivity you involve, the more perspectives you take in to understand the, the complexity of the system. Um, but the process should be um, about inviting more and more individual points of view about how the system is performing or what it looks like from different angles. Um, and, and I want to go back to something, I think it was Clive who said, um, it, it matters who gets to draw the line here. And I, I agree with that. And all the frameworks that I looked at, they had been consulted with the unions and, and so on. And there seems to be some sort of recognition that, yeah, this is important. But I also want to bring to um, part of the discussion is not just who does it, but actually what is the mindset that we bring into these? All the procedures, they take the individual as a starting point that the individual's accountability is at stake here. But as, as I think Jay mentioned, this is also about the team or about the organization that surrounds the individual. But rarely do we start with that. That comes as a sort of a, a circumstance later on. But I think the, the process needs to be reversed. Or it would be really interesting to have a, a process that starts with how did the organization set this system up for success? How did that play out in this? In a, and gradually way, make your way towards the, the last line of defense, the individual um, in the system here to sort of look at the surrounding ecosystem and, and start with the big picture. And rather than, than this sort of unique, it's, the case is almost over if you start with the individual and we, we're here to decide the accountability on the individual. Well, there's only so much space because the battlefield of what the decision has already been set up. So sure, who gets to decide where the line is drawn, but also what is actually the, the model that we have when we go into this? Is safety about individual behavior? Is safety performance about something much wider about system and how how performance comes together and falls apart well if it is then we need to fundamentally rechange that and i think there is a huge opportunity to create learning outcomes by asking more open-ended questions um, and invite more complexity more subjectivity and and just hear people out to be surprised um, about what's going on yeah um, and what i'm hearing is uh, again how process uh, process or the, 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 the organization itself, because it's an, it's an institution. Process comes from a, a, a way of thinking. It challenges our worldview constantly. And I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a fair point. Great, uh, that, that, that's a very wonderful articulation uh, without much notice, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I should read my emails, I guess. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Kim, we'll move you to, to you now. Uh, what's what's your view on, uh, first of all, what's your view on what is learning? Let's start with that first, and then we'll get into why just culture is, is imperative for learning or not. Maybe. Sure. Thanks, Nipin. Uh, yeah, like Daniel, a bit like oh, when Daniel answered it, I thought I think it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a such a valuable question because oftentimes we go, yeah, we just want to learn from this, but we don't actually stop and go, well, actually, what is learning? And um, I really like Daniel's point. Well, you know, it's about um, gaining perhaps an insight that we haven't had before and then acting on it. Uh, so it's, you know, very much something that we do and get involved in. So for me, it's really, you know, learning about unresolved concepts that perhaps haven't emerged before and they're brought to the forefront through this process and this system that we're putting in place to, you know, try to get to this restorative culture. Um, and so for me, in my experience in, you know, setting up, you know, the learning environment in under the Just Culture umbrella, it's really about building that environment for people who perhaps aren't used to being invited to share their realities of being at the sharp end, very much instilling that trust that they understand whatever information that they're going to bring forward, we're going to deal with that in the way that they would like. You know, we're going to do it with it respectfully. It's not going to be used against them. And that's when we start to get those, you know, that second layer of stories start to emerge. We start to then unpack the system and we move vastly away then from this, um, you know, judgment that we put on it and this hindsight bias and, and everything we thought was going to happen, we actually find there's this um, this rationality involved. I do apologise if everyone can hear my dog. 
by the way. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so on that, so your two question then, Nipin, about just culture and learning, 100%, I think it's, you know, the restorative culture concept. If we can get that ecosystem right with the people that we have, um, you know, at the sharp end, we can very much move into this full new state of learning that perhaps we've never had inside our organisation before. And in my experience, practically speaking, if we can get that right, that's when the organisation and all the stakeholders who are perhaps hesitant about just culture and embedding it start to go, wow, actually, this is a really valuable concept for us to have. This is very rich. This will help us move forward as an organisation. This will help us become safer. And that's when we start to really build that trust. And I think then if we're very careful to nurture that and nurture that learning culture, I think we can really start to see quite incredible things happen. Um, and we can really start to shift away to the, you know, shift to that concept of, you know, people empowering people as a solution as we as we talk about, you know, in real sense of actually doing that. Um, yes, yeah, so that's, that's my that's my thoughts. I'm just going to go shut my dog up, Nippin. <laughs> Thank you. No, don't worry. I have a follow-up question for you, but I'll come back to you later. Um, uh, Clive, uh, what's, what, what do you think about the, this notion of learning in the first instance? How, how would you see learning? All right. So I touched on this before. Look, I'm a cognitive psychologist, so we could spend hours talking about the mechanics of learning, what it actually is from a brain perspective, if you like. So we don't have that long sort of time. So let me just say this. Um, what I said before, learning fundamentally is neurons that wire together, fire together. And we're doing it right now. I've learned that Kim has a little dog. I have learned that Daniel actually prefers questions in advance. We're constantly learning, right? We're, we're doing that. And so for me, when we say, you know, or the inference being that we need a just culture in order to learn, that is not true. Don't get me wrong. It may be desirable because we want to learn specific things, but we are learning whether the culture is just or not. Um, so to paraphrase um, sort of some current safety um, vocabulary, in a sense, this is, you know, learning as imagined versus learning as done, right? Um, I'll give you an example here. Um, a company I've, I've been working with for quite a while, they had an incident in the field, two, opera two operatives. One guy actually got a laceration, lost time injury. Both of those uh, operators were stood down. Uh, pending an investigation. This is all part of their Just Culture flow chart. Um, when they came back after the investigation, the suggestion was, we, we're not going to fire you or anything, but what you, listen to the language here, this doesn't sound very just to me, but anyway, what you have to do now is go to every other site, they had several other sites, and we want you to stand up and talk in front of the crews about, you know, what you did, the consequences of what you did, you know, explain that you took a shortcut. Now, again, what is the intent here? The intent is that when those two guys stand in front of those crews, the intent is people will learn about not to take shortcuts and um, all of that stuff. Of course, that's not what happened. You may as well have pinned on the back of those guys a sign saying, I'm an idiot. Um, and as they're up the front, most of the people who are listening to these two gentlemen speak, neither of them are motivated to do what they're doing. Neither are particularly good at public speaking. Pretty much every operative listening to them is feeling sorry for them um, and thinking, gee, I'm glad I'm, I'm not in their shoes. And what they're learning more than anything, because they are learning, is, gee, if I have an incident and nobody sees it, there's no way I'm going to be reporting it because otherwise they'll make me do that too. Learning as imagined, learning as done. So, again, when it comes to just culture, I think we're making the... Um, assumption that what we mean by learning with a just culture is we're going to learn good stuff. We're going to learn things that are going to be helpful for our future state of safety, as was alluded to before, and maybe even work in general. But again, neurons that wire together, fire together. They're always doing that. It doesn't mean the learning is correct, helpful, productive, intended, or even conscious. And so, you know, part of what we need to understand with the just culture thing is, well, what learning are we actually after? Let's get really clear on what are the best methods, the best mechanisms to actually ensure that we're, we're not getting unintended learnings too. And that's a mistake many companies still make in their flowchart approach. A flowchart can never um, be objective as to whether somebody took a reckless risk 
or it was just a mere mistake. No flowchart's going to do that. No process is going to do that. There needs to be agreement on you know, who does make that end call. We need to know who that person is, and we also need to agree that that's probably appropriate. Those are my thoughts. Yes, I, 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 I think um, uh, you, you did mention something uh, in previously also and alluded towards it this time a little bit, which is that we are learning whether it's a just culture or, is, or whether we face injustice Always. or justice. I think that's the key point you're, you're trying to say. Um, okay, great. Thank, thank you, Clive. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, Kim, I, I know you got distracted by the dog, but I just wanted to have one follow-up question with you. Uh, um, uh, is that, was there a light bulb moment in, your, in this shift, in this journey for you, when you started to see the, the power of this, this, what you were trying to bring in? Any example, any, any story you would like to share? Very briefly, of course. Uh, is there anything you would like to to bring? Because I know you 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 did mention this uh, last time, uh, just just recently. Uh, uh, yeah, when you you spoke, yes. Yeah, thank you, Nippon. Uh, yeah, so many light bulb moments, Nippon, and, and you know stories um, that I probably can't share just out of confidentiality for the individuals involved. But one in particular where you know there was um, some of the safety team came rushing in, and they there you know, had been this incident, and they wanted blood. The ops manager quickly came in to say, "Look, Kim, this is what's happened. This is what the safety team." wants to now happen they want to get rid of this guy they've been trying to get rid of him rid of him for some time this is you know they kind of almost you know we're using that as a bit of an excuse um but we were able to you know really pause the process and say okay let, let's do this learning review let's look at it through this new um, way of you know um this new restorative just culture methodology that we're trying to bring into place and i think you know, at the end of that, once we were able to just uncover so much rich learning and so many different layers of what was going on with the individual in the system, and you know, the individual, um, his um, the, just his rational explanation for uh, what he was trying to achieve, and just you know, everything, you know, all the, all the complex factors that go into it. I think all the stakeholders on the back of that were then able to understand where we were trying to get to with this just, just culture methodology. In going then out to site to talk to this individual individual some months later he was extremely appreciative of um you know that learning review that had taken place which was in direct contrast to perhaps what have may have happened in the, in the past and that then reverberated through that work area because they could now see well actually hang on a second there's some safety professionals here who are actually really quite interested in what it's like for us in our day-to-day -day work and they actually want to help and they're actually genuine and authentic when they say that they want to learn. Um, and so that was hugely valuable for the organisation. So that was a real light bulb moment for me to see this, you know, in practice and seeing the flow and effect that it had throughout the organisation. Um, I think the challenge was, though, was that some stakeholders, you know, who were invested in this system, and they, you know, and, and rightly so, given, you know, the role that they played in the organisation in HR, IR, you know, just that ongoing genuine concern about the methodology and how it was being used. And I guess that fear for them that perhaps it meant someone was going to get away with something. So it was that just that consistent approach to working with them, understanding their stakeholder needs and bringing them on that journey. Um but I think another big light bulb moment for not just myself, but for the safety team that I worked with was just on the back of these learning reviews, Nip, and, you know, guys would walk out of these reviews and say, that was the best investigation I've ever been involved in. When's the next one? You know, I've never heard that in my career before. So, you know, I think that for me, it's those anecdotal stories when things like that happen that, you know, you're really starting to make a difference when you're hearing it from, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Brilliant, uh, yes, and which goes back to, I mean, uh, the, the reason I, and I'm glad I asked the question because it goes back to the Clive's point, which is who gets to draw the line. And this is what I was trying to come to terms with. I think, I guess I have two points here. Who gets to draw the line is an important one because often people in position of power and, and authority, uh, it is very difficult for them uh, so uh, to, to, be, to be convinced by this idea of multiple perspectives and 
uh, and, and different views. So, you know, the higher up you go in the organization, uh, the more black and white uh, is the view of most most people. And it's 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 a it's a paradox in its own because as you go up in the organization and you become a leader, you should actually have a, be a more visionary person. But it doesn't always happen that way. But I guess the the, the more important question for me is that, uh, and I think this is what you were alluding towards, which is that. You know, give me the context, give me the rich information, which will help me to empathize with the person. And what my experience so far has been, Kim, is that I think, yes, you can give me, I mean, I can never forget that that moment I was in Singapore and I did a workshop on the Costa Concordia case. And I did a, a very, very rich story. And four o'clock in the afternoon, I, I get waved by one of the attendees and he says, I want to meet you in the, in the coffee room uh, before you leave. And he asked me the question. Yeah, I've heard the whole story. It's 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 very convincing. But I want to ask you a question: Was an alcohol test done on the captain at the time when he had met with the accident? And the point being that meaning making is very very individual to us. You can give me all the context in the world. You can give me a lot of hard data, but I want to believe in what I want to believe in. And this is where I find it very very challenging. But I I, I think that there is also an element of what you said that. Yes, there are instances where people see a lot of information and that brings a change within them and they want to see and they are interested to see things differently. But I think that's again down to the, the idea of power and authority. Are people in position of authority wanting to be moved or not? But brilliant articulation. Thank you very much for that. I'm glad I asked the question. Uh, Jay, uh, over to you now. Uh, what is what is learning in your view, Jay? And how does um, or is is the idea of or the notion of just culture desirable for learning from your perspective? Let's start with what is learning from your point of view first. So, so learning uh, for an individual uh, is, is, you know, either could be just gaining new knowledge, but ideally it should be, uh, and I'm talking about professionals, ideally should be new knowledge that is then put to a new use to improve performance. So improve the, 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 you know, the quality of care I provide my patients. Um, so anything that allows me to improve is a learning experience. Um, a just culture does not have to be a, a, you know, a mandatory thing for learning. Um, I have been in the healthcare long enough to know when there wasn't anything called a just culture um, and, and we have still learned. Um, so, so personal motivation, intrinsic drivers are of course really important. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, the, 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 the key question, I suppose, is learning to serve what purpose? And, and if I say, actually, the learning really should be to serve the purpose of the customer, in this case, our patients, to provide them better care, then surely it is much more meaningful for the organization to learn so that the system can deliver better quality care for a lot of patients rather than one individual to learn so that they may or may not consistently deliver a better informed care in the future. So in order to get the system to improve, learning has to be a daily exercise. So unless we know how we perform our task on a daily basis, we will never be able to have a just culture because the whole notion that this performance lies outside, which I referred to the norm, the outcome is such a powerful driver of that in the absence of data that unless we get better at measuring on a daily basis our performance or the way I look at it, the reflection of our learning is our performance. We will not be able to improve on it without understanding what is the normal function, what is the normal function. I think this whole thing about, you know, somebody does not give antibiotic to a patient for three hours and the patient dies and then we completely dependent on the individual completely ignores the fact that chances are in a busy system, in a busy organization, the norm for delivery of antibiotic could well be two hours and 30 minutes with two standard deviations right between three hours, 30 minutes and one hours. And unless we know that performance, how can we in a, in a just way really say that what you did was something abnormal, but actually it is completely within the realms of normal performance. So, so to me, learning cannot happen, improvement cannot happen unless we absolutely get better at measuring what is it we do on a daily basis? What is the work we actually do versus the work we think we do? Data is the only way to know the work we do. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, and the more data we have from more parts of the system, more 
understanding we have over the complexity of what we try to create. Is there anything else you want to say? It's a long journey and it'll be a constant battle. I don't think we will ever get there, but there will be a lot of joy in learning and how to get there. Yeah, yes. Uh, I, I, I learned something really powerful here, uh, Jay. You don't use the word fatality, you use the word death. Right, which may be very unique to the to the to the healthcare world. I don't come from that world, and I think that's fundamental to what you're saying here. Because in a way, you have been able to manage that expectation that the outcome of what we do could also result into a death, and people enter into that implicit contract when they are availing services from professionals like yourself. We have, you know, in many other in many other professions, we have not been able to get into that implicit contract that fatality is okay. It's okay to have a fatality. So I think that was that was very, very powerful what you said. And I want to think about that a little bit more and come back to you maybe at a later stage. But I, I also wanted to challenge you a little bit on the notion, and I think some of some others also had this this view, and I, I hear that a lot that is learning always about change and improvement. The reason why I say that is that learning is a gamble. Learning is always a gamble because you're, 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 you're working with uncertainty. There's a huge amount of uncertainty whenever we do some, we want to learn something. Training is different, schooling is different, taming is different, but learning is, is a gamble. So I'm not sure if learning will always result in improvement and change. So, and how do you then manage that expectation that when, when learning does not result in improvement and change, when something untowards happen, quite the opposite of it, how is the organization going to deal with that? So, so I think I clarified that from a, from a professional perspective is different. Uh, so, so learning is all about, you know, knowing better. I don't have to do anything with that. I can just read millions of books and learn. I don't have to use that knowledge anywhere. It's unimportant. Um, but if I'm a professional paid by the public, funded by the taxpayer, then my learning absolutely has to be tied to improving the care I give to the public. And that is the accountability question that should always be raised. I am paying you for this. You were doing this 10 years ago. You're still doing this now. What has changed? Why hasn't things improved? Why hasn't it got better? And I think the best we should be doing, that is why data is important, is capturing our efforts on a daily basis on what is it we're trying to learn and how we are trying to learn. So that when learning does not happen, i.e. improved care is not delivered, you can absolutely demonstrate the process through which you tried to, but you failed. And I think the public will be okay with that. Any rational person will be perfectly all right to know that you are learning from a daily performance. You are trying to improve yourself, but within the constraints and the context, this is the best you can do. And that is okay. But not capturing any information is not okay. Um, an anesthetist will never anesthetize a human being and then come out of theater an hour later and saying, we started with a blood pressure of 120. We finished with a blood pressure of 120. The patient must be fine. Actually, the patient would be bloody brain dead in all of that because he had no other data. They will never do that. So you cannot work in a system without measuring daily performance to understand if you are on the right trajectory or you are not. Can I put forward an alternative point of view? Please, please do. Yes, yes. So That's what obviously, um, obviously, Jay, different industry, so so different approach. But again, um, what if um, I'm working in the construction industry here in Australia, for example? And what I learn is um, I work for a contracting company. And of course, we're always chasing the next job. And this is going on a lot here. And what I find out is um, part of how clients select their contractors, one of the um, criteria is their safety record, which is usually based, of course, on lag indicators, lost time injury rates. And what I know is um, we, uh, I run a very honest company and we, re we report everything. What I know is I've just seen a company who I know don't do safety as well, who've got a lower LTI rate only because they don't report them. I've, I'm a professional. Um, I run a company. I've got people to employ. I've got people to pay. But what I've learned is if we report less LTIs, I'm way more likely to get the contract with that client. That's also learning. 
Indeed. I'm just conscious of, of the time. We are coming to the end of the hour. Um, it's been a wonderful discussion with so many different views on both just culture and learning. And I would like to thank all the panelists uh, uh, for, for being so kind, uh, some, some even working outside of their hours of work in very odd times so to, to share their perspectives. I cannot be more grateful for, for this. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to those who have joined us. We'll obviously turn it into a, a recorded video and also a podcast later on. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, get this to, to people who were not able to, to be present for this session. But any parting words very, very quickly from anyone before we wrap up? I'm, I'm quite okay to go for a couple of minutes. If, if there's any burning desire or a question or a comment in your minds. Nipin, uh, just to say thank you. It's such a valuable uh, conversation that you've opened up over the series. And certainly I've taken away a lot of learning and I'm now keen to go away and look at how we understand normal work and how this fits into our whole just culture process based on what Jay was saying. That's a real insight for me. And you know, how can we just expand this out even more? I think there's just such an incredible opportunity with the synergy between those two things. So thank you, Nipin. It's been fantastic. Thanks. Thank you. And likewise, yes. Anyone else wants to say anything? Um, ditto, Kim. And it's been lovely to see you again too, Kim. But, but everybody, I've really enjoyed listening to you. Some very different perspectives. Uh, my final thought would be, why, why would we limit just culture to only after an incident? Yes. Why wouldn't we just implement just culture as a way that we actually do work? That's the thought. Thank you, Clive. Yes. I think I would absolutely, absolutely echo that, which is why I'm so insistent on measuring daily performance, because, uh, you know, without that, we can never say when our investigation starts, if that was truly just, because we don't know what the norm was. Thank you, Jay. Daniel, anything from you? No, I just thank you, Nipin. This has been um, inspiring in many ways. Thank you. Likewise, and thank you to all the participants. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will see you again for the sixth and the final part. Uh, I will end the broadcast now, but you can stay online for a few minutes if you don't mind talking to me for a few seconds.